If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here. Since the late 90s, I've been collecting film magazines. Now this obsession was kind of fueled by uh, my Superman collecting, I suppose. I, I started collecting the memorabilia associated with the Christopher Reeve films. Here, for example, is a Japanese kind of program for Superman 3, um, but kind of inside this amazing image, imagery of Chris and shots from the film and a kind of fold out section, which is pretty cool for something from 1983. Over the years, I know I can sort of continued collecting stuff associated with the Chris Reeve films and you'd kind of extend that search through to kind of magazines and you find things like Starlog, Photoplay, Films and Filming, Fantastic Films, Starburst and we've got a few issues here. Um, we've got obviously Starlog here, famous issue with Harrison Ellenshaw kind of discussing his work on Star Wars. Um, you know we've got the, an older issue of Starburst, a UK publication, which is very similar to Starlog at the time, but Starburst kind of went through this kind of, it got thinner and thinner throughout the years and kind of got revamped a number of years ago and it still, still is sold today, unlike Starlog, which kind of finished a while back. But this is kind of covering Clash of the Titans, Superman 2, for example, and Excalibur. Um, we get obviously a later issue of Starburst where it kind of got a bit bigger and it got thinner as well. So they're kind of covering He-Man the movie and some other bits and bobs around that time. Uh, things like Starlog and Starburst around this time became a bit too obsessed with Star Trek The Next Generation and covered them extensively. So it became a bit annoying if you're a movie buff trying to find something on the latest film with what one page and like eight or 10 pages dedicated to Star Trek. Um, here's an example of Photoplay. Um, this is from 1983 for obviously the coverage of Superman 3. That's why I got it. A bit of stuff on there with Octopussy as well. Another issue from another magazine, sorry, called Movie Star uh, from 1981, uh, covering Superman 2. So obviously you see a trend here because we're all like covering Superman related stuff. Um, but it just shows you the sort of wide selection of magazines around this time. Um, films and filming with Superman 3. That went on for a while actually, this magazine. But this as well, it's got 44 pages. It's quite thin. Most of these all have black and white um, imagery inside. Um, and we have Film Review around that same time as well, covering Superman 3. I do have issues, of, you know, covering Superman the movie uh, as well. Um, obviously we've got Fantastic Films, which is covering Empire Strikes Back. But this is obviously a little bit bigger than uh, Film Review and Starburst. Early 90s came a magazine called Fantasia, which is weirdly at the time, um, I saw Ninja Turtles the movie in 1990, and afterwards I bought a very early issue of this magazine featuring had a Ninja Turtle on the front cover. So that was kind of my kind of window into film news and film reviews. But I didn't continue buying this kind of magazine. I, at the time, I was obsessed with video games. I was buying Me Machines and CVG every month, whatever, with my pocket money. And this is kind of a later issue, but um, this didn't last long, um, sadly. Um, I picked up a bunch of these recently because it had weirdly had some news and about Superman 5 around that time from like 1992 where Chris Reeve is kind of umming and ahhing about returning to play the Man of Steel but sadly never did. Um, also the topic of this discussion of this video is my favourite uh, magazine from this kind of period is Cine Fantastique which kind of finished a long time ago. It covered movies quite extensively with very in-depth behind the scenes kind of information provided. Uh, around that time as well there was something there was a magazine kind of tailored to more of the experts which was called Cine Fex. Um, a few have a few issues here. We have like the Rocketeer covered, uh, Alien 3, uh, oh, <laughs> we got uh, Batman and we have one uh, more kind of really a fairly recent one on Superman Returns from 2006. This sadly finished about a year ago, I believe, or just under a year ago. So yeah, you know, these, these were kind of for, for film experts and people who are obsessed with visual effects and makeup design and special effects and so forth. Um, but these are obviously becoming quite collector's items. The Batman one in particular was kind of quite pricey, but um, yeah, I'll cut, obviously cut to close up so you can see what's inside these magazines. Because if you are a film buff and you love to know more about a particular movie, Sometimes in the case of, you know, a new collector's edition that comes out, doesn't come with a commentary, doesn't come with anything kind of extensive about a particular movie, you've got to go do your research and find the old film magazines. And in the case of like Cinefax, for example, huge breakdowns and coverage of what was going on. And obviously with this one, we've got interviews, with, you know, with Derek Meddings, got uh, behind the scenes photos. And Alien 3, for example, has um, a wealth of information, which has kind of really blew me away at the time. 
um, and you know these are sort of cherished items for film fans. But in the case of what we're discussing today, see Fantastique. Now, uh, during my sort of days of collecting stuff for the Superman films, I haven't stopped collecting, but I just kind of cherry pick what I want. Superman, there was one issue um, that kind of just had a review on Superman 3 and it discussed and it gave a little article about the, the video game sequence in that film. But it mainly covered Jaws 3D. So if you're a huge fan of that film or just kind of love it as a curiosity really um, and there's a huge amount in here about its visual effects and how they were done, how the 3D effects were done and all the miniature work. I mean it's just like so comprehensive you know you probably even at the time I don't think there was probably a detailed making of book so getting something like this would probably be vital for a fan to sort of do their own research and find additional information. Thankfully I think George 3D is quite well extensively covered online with information so when I reviewed it a long time ago I didn't really have to sort of go back and forth to this magazine. I think maybe at the time I probably forgot I had it. Now Sydney Fantastic weren't really well known for their sort of views on movies. They were very sort of like questionable with their with their ratings. Um, Starlog from what I remember I don't think they ever reviewed movies. Um, I flicked through some of the magazines and I think what, where's, where are the reviews? But it was mostly about what's coming out on TV, you know, video, laser disc, movie news, interviews with people. See Fantastic had reviews at the back. When I reviewed like the last Star Wars film, you know, I said that you know, Empire Strikes Back, for example, you know, didn't receive all the love at the time from film critics and people got a bit pissed off saying, trying to, re you know, uh, revising history. But the publication that didn't really like Star Wars um, was Cine Fantastic. They gave Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back not particularly strong reviews, which is kind of interesting, you know, because everyone else was just like, oh my God, these films are incredible. But these guys, you know, weren't particularly happy. And they, they gave Superman 3 probably justly so, it's quite a scathing review. But it wasn't about the reviews I was concerned about. You know, I'm not, people are always entitled to their own opinions. Not everyone's going to agree with each other, right? When their magazine has some of the best movie coverage, and like, you know, for example, The Shadow, which has, you know, extensive coverage about how they made it, the visual effects, the map paintings, interviews with the cast, the director, the origins of The Shadow, um, far more information than what you would find in say probably a making of book. And I don't think there was a making of book on The Shadow because the movie kind of underperformed and was kind of forgotten about but at the time it was kind of seen as this like big production from Universal Pictures and you know if you're if you want to know more about this movie outside of say buying the Blu-ray which has a kind of a couple of featurettes or a retrospective on it this has far more information provided in this magazine than say than say what's been put out already. And obviously other things here, we've got one covering uh, Robocop. Um, so we've got coverage on there of that movie, got coverage of The Predator. Um, the, no, just Predator, not The Predator. <laughs> you've got a, a shabby sequel, Christopher Reeves soars again, we'll see with Superman 4. An interview with Harrison Ellenshaw on the visual effects. There's a section on The Predator, right? And it gives you like a little image there of this little optical effect of him turning invisible. It shows you how they did it, the original makeup designs for uh, The Predator. Uh, just talking about the score to the film, I mean, crazy is that? The man in the suit. This issue here, covering Evil Dead 3, Army of Darkness. Yeah, again, you know, if you love the sort of the breakdown and coverage of, you know, all your favourite movies, you've got an interview there with um, Sam Raimi, uh, Evil Dead, talking about the history of Evil Dead, the makeup world of Evil Dead 3, production design, making a bit on Evil Dead 2, about making the sequel with Dino De Laurentiis, um, interview with Bruce Campbell, visual effects work. I mean, it's, it's just like a dream, you know, for fans of this kind of stuff. And a whole section on the intro vision projection stuff they did in the film, which is really fucking cool. Some of it can be a little bit, you know, heavy on the technical side, but, you know, I think it's kind of it's, it's relatively easy reading. Um, and it's just information overload. Loads of information. It's not about, like, see Fantastic's kind of views on the film they're covering, only when there's actually a review at the end. So it's just like, pure information for you to sort of absorb and take on and just like, you know, and if you want to do your own reviews or something like that, or you're writing an article about a particular movie, go on eBay and find an old issue of Cine Fantastique. You know, you're going to be sorted. Now this one here, they covered Robocop 3. The same month, they had a different cover covering Jurassic Park. But at the time, you know, they probably didn't know Jurassic Park was going to be like 
they, maybe they probably knew it was going to be a massive movie, but it seems like their bets were on Robocop 3. Obviously, you know, they always had like these crazy kind of cool, like bespoke artwork for their covers and uh, not just relying on just an image that does us grab from the press kit, whatever. Um, so, you know, Robocop 3, you know, not a great film. Um, obviously, there's a whole section on here, Jurassic Park, which is fucking cool. Interview with Phil Tippett, stop motion uh, effects work, you know, which are kind of which they were going to do uh, in the film. More detailed stuff there with Phil. Production design on Jurassic Park. We've got like Dennis Muren, great FX guy, one of the best, talking about how they did the CGI. Stan Winston interview, and then you get to like Robocop Three, and then you've got like a whole massive coverage on Robocop Three. You know, a film which was kind of delayed for two years. So you got you know a bit on the uh, making of, again special effects, rewriting Robocop Two and, and, and Three. Essentially, that was going to be obviously the film will be separated in half. The Frank Miller script. Yeah, just like, you know, just so much stuff. CGI effects in Robocop 3, which were kind of done by specific data images, um, which was the opening Delta City sequence. Production design, optical effects with the flying effects with the rocket pack, which was aren't particularly brilliant, but they're not awful. They're not like Superman 4 bad. Um, and we got like another one, see Fantastic with Highlander. How fucking cool is that? Look at that cover, and that's a great cover. But it gives you their, their sort of ratings, like must see, excellent, good, mediocre, worthless. So they've got things like Enemy Mine, which is kind of done like, it's got, mostly got twos, like it's good, it's good. Um, Brazil, pretty much just like excellent, I must see. One saying it's kind of mediocre, a fool. Santa Claus the movie, okay, okay, what we got here? Santa Claus the movie, one star, mediocre. Good, worthless, worthless, mediocre, um, good and good. So it's kind of like, mm, it's all right, basically. Um, one person saying it's worthless. We've got an issue here of The Rocketeer. Now, this is a great movie. Obviously, it celebrated its, was it 30th anniversary uh, recently? This has you know, a, quite, a bit, quite a big bit on Bill and Ted Go to Hell. Well, which is Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Quite, yeah, There's quite a lot there, actually, on bogus journey. I'll see, but the, the main selling point is The Rocketeer. Um, we have the sort of the comic book origins, interview with the director. We've got a sort of kind of what Dave, St what Dave Stevens was kind of inspired by interview with Bill Campbell, the star, um, how they designed the costume and so forth. We've got an image there of John Wesley's ship as the Flash, so I presume the same costume designers there. Production design, yeah, really cool. I mean, that's like, that's a, that's a very good issue, worth getting hold of. Now this issue caused a lot of um, complaints from the readers. Basically, uh, there's a whole massive article on Alien 3. This is from June of 1992. Um, we've got here sort of the hiring, firing lawsuits and storyline um, of Alien 3. So the, the major sort of problems they had getting this off the ground and, and what script to go with. We've got like basically how Michael Bean got axed. So for, for someone who's not familiar with what was kind of going on, who's going to be in Alien 3, finding out Michael Bean's not going to be in it is kind of a bit of a spoiler, right? Um, we've got William Gibson's kind of Alien 3 kind of ideas, which were never used. Uh, the fate of Ripley in Alien 4, things like that, development hell section, which is really kind of interesting. And they talk about, they've seen like the work print of it, a review of the work in progress, right? So there's loads of kind of information that kind of gives away the ending of the film. And the readers were pissed because they kind of, I think I've got the following issue. I think they kind of highlighted some of the upset people. Well, I suppose rightly so, you know, if you're a fan of the kind of film and, you know, you kind of find yourself like, oh, there's nothing... If everything's been spoiled, but a lot of films that kind of got spoiled at the time, you know, like if you go back and watch Roger Ebert's review of The Postman, they show the ending in the fucking review. It's crazy. Um, this month, uh, from July of 1990, had two covers, Robocop 2 and Dick Tracy. Um, same information in both, but you've got to have, you know, just the covers are just so good, you know, they're so cool. I mean, I think that got used again for the Blu-ray of um, Robocop 2, the Shout Factory one. But yeah, again, extensive coverage on Dick Tracy and Robocop 2. There's loads, Robocop 2 stuff is really pretty cool because they've got the corporate war stuff. Like the original ideas for Robocop 2. The whole section, there's two sections on it, it's pretty crazy. They've got, you know, also interviewed Peter Weller. They've got more information about the visual effects. I mean, this is like proper making of material here. This isn't just like, hey, a kind of short electronic press kit they would have given out for some, you know, for these, uh, interviews. I mean, there always were a bit like kind of short, weren't they, when you saw these kind of mini making of featurettes on the film. 
Um, and they're always like five, 10 minutes at most. And everyone's just kind of backslapping each other. But this is just kind of like a full like breakdown of everything in there, interviews with the, the, the key players. And you've got some, you know, a beauty like um, this issue here, which is a double issue, which covers the making of Batman and Beetlejuice, both Tim Burton um, features. Well, at the time, when I was writing my review of Beetlejuice, there was nothing on the film, like, in terms of like production info, really. There's only little bits here and there. So this magazine came in handy for like, a lot of the visual effects work. Um, so I could sort of, you know, pull information from these, take a few snaps of some behind the scenes material because nothing online. Um, so that was really kind of handy. And then you've got a massive section on Batman. We have, everyone loves, you know, the production design of the 89 film. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what you think of the film as a story or whatever, but I think the whole film, like, it's so interesting like, how they made it. Just like the Cinefix issue, there's tons of information in this. And those are photos I, I hadn't seen before, you know. Um, I mean, Batman fans, obsessive ones, probably have all these images. But yeah, I mean, it's just so extensive. It's just like mind-blowing stuff. Um, and, it, and it kind of trumps everything I kind of read in Starlog and Starburst because they were just kind of very two-page articles. There was never anything super extensive. It's also like a little bit of information here, which I could probably, you know, you know, absorb and take on. But it, it felt it was more for the general public, where this is just like for hardcore kind of movie buffs who were just obsessed over, you know, how the film, how films were made. If you weren't going to buy Cine Fantastique, you're going to buy Cine Effects. Um, and we got issue like, for example, it's you know. Uh, just Dread, um, which, you know, not a great movie with Stallone, but that at the time had a making of book. Um, and this has far more information in this. It's far, probably far more candid than the uh, making of book. So you've got the comic origins, interview with Stallone. You've got makeup effects design. You've got Diane Lane's character, which is obviously Judge Hershey. Production design, clearly obviously Blade Runner inspired. And then we have like the special visual effects breakdown as well, which is just like, it just goes on for ages. And you've got the comic relief of Rob Schneider, Rob Schneider, ugh. And then you've got an interview with, with, with the uh, line producer kind of going, in, going into how the sort of film came about. And then weirdly, at the, behind that, you've got a section on Mortal Kombat, the video game, which I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, now, this issue here, this is the issue that has the review of Predator, which is great because I just, I just fucking laugh my ass off. This is his review for Predator, one star. Uh, the derivative movie, which if you eliminate its explicit gore, could have been made in the 1950s. Veers from boredom to lame humour to eye-filling violence. Long battle between Arnold and the slimy title character. The perfect summer movie for a noisy young audience. I mean, whoa, you know, it's not, that's, that's, that's the thing. You know, you think like all these wonderful movies we, you know, we grew up on. You know, they, it's, it basically, like they've all just been panned. Th these are the kind of funny surprises you come across. Um, obviously in this issue as well, it's got Masters of the Universe kind of breakdown of Little Shop of Horrors with whole, the whole like crazy ending with the miniature um, which they cut from the movie and they showed years later which is just like some of the finest miniature work I've ever seen. Crazy while they deleted it but it showed it was a, it was a sad ending, it wasn't a happy ending. So there you go. Well folks that is the end of the video, hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's a shame a lot of these great magazines are no longer around. Um, Starburst is, it got kind of refreshed and kind of you know expanded upon a number of years ago so it's quite a thick magazine now covering a lot of stuff where the earlier issues are kind of like borderline sort of pamphlets you know <laughs> like 30 pages or something like that so now it's a proper magazine obviously there's other film magazines you know, sort of around like empire and total film but those never really resonated with me um there's a few issues which i had but I never really sort of kept them. These are sort of magazines you kind of want to keep and they're far more extensive with their coverage of a particular film. And it's a shame these aren't kind of online and able to read very easily. Thankfully, in the case of Starlog, you can still get those. I'm sure Cinefix probably had a large PDF kind of archive of their, of their back issues if you were a subscriber. Um, but in the case of Cine Fantastique, you know, it's a magazine that's kind of no, no longer with us. And, you know, it may piss people off due to their sort of reviews at the time, but their coverage was kind of second to none. And you, thankfully you can still get these on eBay at good prices. I've, I've got far more issues I've not shown you guys. These are kind of select ones which I thought were really cool. And, um, and hopefully, you know, if you are a particular fan of Robocop or Dick Tracy or The Shadow and want to find out more information, definitely pick up some of these back issues. Well folks, that is the end. Take care of yourselves and I'll be back soon with some more videos. Bye bye.